The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, with a special tip for some of my viewers and orchestration challenge participants. And that is, you just have to stop burying your flutes. Flute in its low and middle registers is far more easily buried in the texture than many orchestrators realize. The same goes for alto and bass flute in any register. I've mentioned this point countless times in evaluating orchestral scores that viewers of my channel send to me, especially for my orchestration challenges. I've made the observation part of several tips, lists of do's and don'ts, and orchestration education materials, and still I see the same old error cropping up again and again. So here's a tip specifically dedicated to the whole problem of balance, color, and strength of register in the flute family. Let's start by defining these registers first. At least in terms of overblowing and fingering, all members of the flute family operate the same way, with a lowest octave of fundamental tones, a middle octave of overblowing second partials, and a top octave overblowing from the third to the seventh partials. These octaves can be further divided into four distinct registers, starting with a low register from the lowest written middle C, or B3 with today's standard concert flute, up to G4. Here is where the flute is at its most deliciously velvety and breathy. Many superbly expressive solos have been composed in this register. One thing you'll notice about nearly all of those solos, though, is that they're very lightly accompanied when scored in an orchestral setting. In order for the notes of this weakest register to project in any meaningful way, the supporting instruments must play it just a little above a whisper. Above this, the middle register is composed of a few more fundamental notes, plus a few notes overblowing the second partial. While there's a gradual increase of projection, the flute really lacks any kind of significant power in this range against the combined forces of the orchestra in a loud texture. In tutti scoring of more moderate strength, it might still be advisable to avoid any note lower than D5 on the flute. But in terms of featured melodic playing and solos, it's really best to apply a similar approach to that of the low register, lighter accompaniment that allows the beauty of this mixed register to shine through. I've released a separate video tip covering the extraordinary qualities of this poetic register, but all that I'll mention for now is that everything which makes the flute unique here is easily swallowed up by any kind of forceful energy from the rest of the orchestra. Use restraint for the best results.
From the pitch of A5, the flute really comes into its own. The high register from there to G6 contains notes of beautifully balanced strength of projection and expressiveness. These notes can sing out with clarity and force in most tutti scoring, and yet possess a wonderful elegance and subtlety of nuance that's easy to hear, and all the more emotionally powerful in this stronger register. The very highest notes from A6 to D7 gain in strength as the notes ascend, and become harder and harder for the player to control dynamically. And yet the trade-off is that these altissimo notes are very easily heard above most orchestral tumults. All the same, this upper register of the flute isn't completely invulnerable to interference by other instruments. If the brass, especially the trumpets, are pushed into their higher registers, their overtones will tend to swamp the flutes. And pretty much anything else, unless most or all of the higher instruments of the orchestra combine in some way to balance. There's also the phenomenon of the flute's tone absorbing into the first violins when doubling them from an octave higher. This was an intentional effect utilized by classical era composers from time to time in order to make their first violin lines more radiant, but flute players can easily cancel this just by playing out a little. Once again, I've made a tip about this you can read on the main website. There are many fine examples of high register flutes doubling a string melody, playing octaves with oboes or clarinets, or even doubling high oboes and clarinets. The flute's sparkling overtones lead the thematic line with ease, adding an edge to the strings. absorbing and building on reed instruments from below. And evening out the thinness of the reeds in unison. But the efficacy of these strategies falls apart when forced downward. I would say that this is possibly the most repeated error in scores I've evaluated. That a surging, soaring string line doubled by flute swoops downward into registers in which the flute contributes little to no tone weight. And it's so easy to fix this by dovetailing the woodwind doubling of the line into oboes or clarinets. Often, the right thing to do in such combinations is self-evident to the experienced score reader. And yet there are many combinations that don't work so well. Just like trumpets, 
Horns pose a problem for flutes when brought into close proximity, in both intonation and balance. The horn's overtones tend to absorb nearby flutes in their low and middle registers. and shout over the flutes in their higher register. But usually the sound that the orchestrator's looking for can be achieved simply by substituting clarinets for horns, which immediately solves the balance problems as well. Another problem in the unfortunate combinations basket is voice crossing. This can work beautifully in different configurations between reed instrument families, and even reeds and horns. but the flute is at a disadvantage, both due to competition between tone qualities and strengths of register. At extremely soft dynamics, a lot of unlikely combinations become workable. But add any pungency to an oboe or clarinet line above harmonizing flutes below, and the results are less successful. There's also the case with interlocking harmonies between flutes and reeds. The enclosed flute note will always be at a disadvantage compared to the reeds on either side. It's usually better to stack harmonies in these cases, with flutes over oboes and or clarinets. One phenomenon that arises again and again, flutes in octaves. There are any number of ways to score this, but generally speaking, the lower flute shouldn't go below a second partial D5 if an exposed line is to maintain a perfect balance. Below D5, the lower flute's difference in character becomes more and more pronounced, which, while not unpleasant, is still a factor to take into account. When doubled with strings, the combination produces a very cool but bright tone, which some orchestrators try to warm up or humanize by doubling the lower flute with oboe. But the oboe will sound so much stronger and warmer in this range that the orchestrator might as well just leave out the second flute, or use it to double the first flute in unison above. And as I mentioned before, Here's where we end up with soaring lines pushing the flute down to the point of complete inaudibility, especially so for that low second flute doubled by oboe. Everything mentioned so far about the standard flute also applies to the piccolo, and doubly so for alto and bass flutes. The piccolo's first octave from written D4 to C-sharp 5 has a somewhat delicate sound, easily swamped by aggressive orchestral scoring, and important lines in this range should be scored on standard flute, 
so much more powerful over the same notes, or at least doubled. As for the lower auxiliary flutes, their wider bores result in a different quality of tone, making them somewhat weaker throughout their entire range. This means that scoring them in any register will require the same care that the orchestrator must apply to the standard flute's lower octave and a half of range, at least if alto or bass flutes are to contribute significantly to a texture or thematic statement. Normally, at this point in an orchestration tip video, I might mention ways in which great composers broke the rules, and then drop a little score study excerpt on you. But this is in some ways such an extensive and complex topic, about misapprehensions that are made so many times, that I've made two additional videos for you. The first is an exploration of examples of what appears to be composers ignoring what I say in this video. But if you look a little deeper, you'll see that they have a great deal of concern for the flute's strengths and weaknesses. The second video is a deep analysis of Daphnis and Chloe, covering a particular extended section that's as close to a flute concerto that Ravel ever got. Watch for those two videos coming soon. And please, please, think about what you're doing when you score low flute in a loud passage.